I'm really very happy to be here uh, today and to uh, have an opportunity to open this uh, short meeting uh, uh, that uh, we organized uh, together with the privacy camp organizers uh, in order to uh, discuss the problems which uh, are uh, right now on the agenda of all the data protection authorities, uh, <coughs> including European Data Protection Supervisor, and which uh, drive us to the discussion with the civil society. Uh, I'm very happy of the choice of the subjects because uh, the privacy camp and the round tables like that are not organized in order to preach. They are not organized in order to teach. They are not organized in order to give the statements or to present the positions. They are actually to discuss about the practical problems that we have. And let's be frank at the very beginning. Uh, these are the problems that we will have not only generally with the GDPR and the new reform of the data protection law, but also the problems that we will have between the data protection authorities and the civil society organizations. Uh, I think that might be a little bit controversial, but it will be frank to say that uh, we will be arguing about these things. We will have the conflicts between data protection authorities, between themselves, between uh, each of the authorities. We will have the problems between the NGOs and the civil society groups. And we will have the conflicts between the data protection authorities and the civil society groups in these two main item, items uh, that we are going to discuss today. Challenges to GDPR implementation, individual and collective redress mechanism, and uh, monitoring illegal contact online, noti uh, notice and uh, action procedures. Being in my previous life, uh, quite connected with the uh, electronic communication and electronic commerce, uh, I know how difficult it is uh, to, do, to deal with the practical issues connected with notice and takedown procedures and uh, all the things connected with instrumentalization of the law in order to prepare different kind of censorships. And uh, I will not reveal the secrets when I will say that inside the Data Protection Authority Society, including inside the office of the EDPS, there are very different views on the way that the data protection authorities should be involved in the whole idea of monitoring illegal context, whatever these three words may mean. So we need to discuss, and we need to discuss it now, not when the conflict will happen, but now when we are still in the preparation phase for the new laws that are already passed and which will be passed in the nearest future, and for the challenges that we have. So, very happy to be here. I'm very happy to meet all of you here. I hope that will be not only the presentation, we will have not only the presentations, but uh, first of all the discussion. Uh, we will be joined in a while by uh, Giovanni Buttarelli, <coughs> my European Data Protection Supervisor. I'm the deputy of Giovanni Buttarelli. My name is Wojciech Wigodowski. I used to be the Data Protection Commissioner in Poland before. And right now, I'm here in the office of the uh, institution, EDPS that is responsible for uh, supervision of the EU institutions, bodies, and agencies. So let's be clear for those who do not have that much contact with the data protection authorities, we are not hierarchically over any other data protection authority in the countries of origin uh, of you. So uh, there are data protection authorities in all the 20, 28 countries of uh, uh, the EU. The EDPS is responsible for supervision of the, uh, uh, of the EU bubble, but also will be providing the secretariat for the European Data Protection Board that will exchange work in Party of Article 29. So for us, uh, this is not an academic discussion. This is not a discussion about the laws that we want to interpret. This is the practical problem that we will have uh, in the nearest uh, future. So let me then pass the floor to Sari, who will be the moderator today, and to those who will be ma making the presentation. And also, uh, in uh, the uh, if, uh, as EPPS, I would like to thank uh, Natalia especially and Ernani for preparing the things uh, from our side to this uh, interesting event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wojciech. Um, thank you so much for this huge turnout. It's uh, I think it's going to be very interesting sessions. 
Okay. What we're going to do, uh, so perhaps I'll introduce myself. Um, my name is Sally Dupno. I'm a professor here at uh, uh, Saint Louis. So welcome to our <laughs> wonderful institution. Um, I'm also a, a lawyer and, uh, well, in that sense, also very much interested, of course, in all the practical issues that we're going to discuss today. What we're going to do, we're having two sessions. So we're starting until more or less like 11 o'clock, 11 10 at uh, maximum, we'll be discussing the issues related to individual redress and collective redress. And after uh, perhaps a um, well, short breathing uh, break, we'll go on to the, all the issues and all the fundamental rights involved in uh, the notices and programs. Um, how we're going to structure it, there's going to be two presenters uh, for each session. They're going to have very brief presentations, and I hope everybody will respect um, the, the, the brief time that is, has, been, has been given to them. About seven to 10 minutes for some, well, sharing of experiences from a very uh, practical point of view. And then the floor will be open to questions. So there's many, many of you here, so I hope that we can have a very fruitful debate. Um, then uh, I would like to uh, draw your attention to the fact that there's two hashtags if you want to engage in all these platform activities, you want to uh, engage in a discussion online, you can use hashtag EDPS SIP SOC 2018 and Privacy Camp 2018. Hashtags, two hashtags. So let's start with the first session. First session, uh, starting from perhaps <coughs> privacy, uh, the Data Protection Directive, where we have no special provisions on collective redress. There was uh, a lot of, well, burden was upon the, the individual uh, for making their rights respected and enforce them in, in uh, the, the courts of law. Of course, limited effect, of course, because while well, we see that people apparently do not care enough for their uh, personal data to actually engage and initiate legal proceedings. So GDPR comes. Then we have these possibilities, we have a reinforcement of the, 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 the rights to redress for the individuals, for this data subject, Expl explicit uh, rights to file a complaint before supervisory authorities, file a complaint before courts against supervisory authorities, or uh, initiate legal proceedings immediately before the courts. Um, in addition to that, we have this possibility now to have collective redress. So individual data subjects can give a mandate to uh, well, non not for profit organizations that have some kind of expertise in data protection in order to well have their um, their rights uh, respected. And even there is this possibility, <coughs> if the member states allow it, to for uh, these these not for profit organizations to initiate legal proceedings immediately. Now, how, what this is going to look like is not very clear yet. So we're, there's a lot of practical, practical questions. And it says, I'm very happy to pass uh, the, 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 the word to uh, Javier, who has um, experience from the Open Rights Group. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, so thank you. I think you understand, so you can hear me at the back of the room. <coughs> probably is here. So yeah, I'm Javier. I'm from, the, I'm from Spain, as you can probably hear. But I live in the UK, and I work for the Open Rights Group where we've been um, taking quite a, a leading role in trying to push for stronger collective redress at the moment as the UK goes through the implementation of GDPR. So for us, collective redress is really, really important because the bottom-up approach to enforcement we think is going to be critical for GDPR to be a success. So companies are right now being scared of fines, everyone that nobody really knows how it's going to work. But we think that for the for change to happen, we are going to need pressure from individuals to go up towards the data protection authorities and the courts and eventually to companies to also change their tack, change their behavior. And it's um, a collective redress and um, it's important because we've been going to the DPA in the UK many, many times with complaints and they always say the same thing, well, bring us the complaints, where are the people affected, where is the harm? You know, that, so you do need you know, people to, um, to take action. And you need to make it very easy for people to take action. Unfortunately, we think that GDPR really, um, when, when it was drafted, has got some shortcomings, you know, and we're trying to fix some of those now in the national implementations. So what's in GDPR? I mean, as I said, there is a basic statutory power that has to be implemented by all member states where individuals can instruct certain non-profit organizations to do certain things. Those organizations are not just any non-profit. Actually, there is a quite restricted criteria, which is they have to be non-profit, they have to be, they have, need to have public interest objectives, 
So they need to have a registered public interest objective in their statutes. And they need to be active in the field of data protection. So for example, it's a bit unclear at the moment whether many consumer organizations, like the typical consumer rights groups in many countries in Europe, would be allowed under the criteria to be part of the course if they start being active in the field of data protection that may change. Then what action? As I said before, the, the statutory powers cover taking a complaint to the DPA, complaining about the DPA, taking a complaint that the DPA hasn't done their job properly, including taking the DPA to court, and also to put a judicial complaint. And that's, um, I mean, that's quite important, you know, because, uh, you know, obviously there is, <coughs> at the moment, you know, we, people can do all those things, you know, but without support, you know, from an NGO, you know, it can be quite daunting for an individual to, uh, to do any of those, any of those things. Now, what is really interesting and where, where we think that there is a big problem with the GDPR is right now is that there are some extra optional powers that at the moment don't seem to have been taken up you know, on the way any country to allow non-profits to do those things without the need for an individual to tell them. Mm. You know, so an NGO can go and say, see something wrong and then say, well, okay, you know, we want to put a complaint or we actually want to even go to court and start taking a company to court without the need for an individual to... to and that is very important. For example, you could you know, give some examples of for why, but let's just say quickly, you got a whistleblower telling you that there's something wrong in a company, but you don't know any of the data subjects involved. You cannot put a complaint as an NGO, you know, because you need someone affected. So where is the person affected? God knows where they are. So that is really, really important. So now the other thing to understand about those powers that they're actually, um, there's another power, which is a power for <coughs> nonprofits to help people claim compensation. And those things get a bit uh, mixed. So there is an optional power to do to take independent complaints, and there is an optional power to help claim economic compensation. And those things, I mean, at the moment, there are, for example, the UK has implemented the right to help to help people get compensation, but not the right to take independent action. And uh, that gets a bit blurred. I mean, at the moment, what we know is that many DPAs will allow NGOs to complain and will investigate. In many countries, and we've done, you know, in some cases, they, they will do it. But what is definitely not happening is for NGOs to be able to go to court. And that is where really, I mean, that is really a big problem. Because many, many cases have already been thrown out because NGOs don't have a stand. I think people from Privacy International in this room have got a few examples themselves. So why we need this? I mean, what we have found, the research in the UK shows that, you know, from consumer group which that one in five UK consumers, you know, they wouldn't know how to claim redress following a data breach. That's 20% of people, they just wouldn't know how to go about it. And their um, three quarters of people in the survey say they would definitely welcome an independent body helping them. So there is evidence in the UK that, you know, these powers are needed and for some reason, you know, so it's not too late, you know. I mean, I think that many countries are now, I mean, it's probably too late for many of the implementations of GDPR for the ancillary laws, you know, but it's not too late in the sense that, you know, these powers could be added at any time, basically. So, why um, why we need this? So, the, our reasons for supporting independent, um, independent action, independent of the data subject, is that in many cases what we are finding is that there are really complex data environments where it's really, really impossible for people to know whether they are affected. You know, if you look at some of the online advertising, you know, uh, ecosystem graphs, you know, that are out there on the internet, you'll see that companies are sending data, that, you know, around, and it's just really, really difficult to know what's happening. Or just not know what happened with Experian, you know, the US company that got hacked, and we know that there are several million people in the UK that potentially had their data stolen, but they don't know who they are, and they are now waiting. They are at the mercy of Experian, basically, to tell them where they were hacked. The other argument we see in favor of implementing this is to protect anonymity. So you have sometimes the um, data breaches which involve, for example, dating sites, you know, where people may not want to come forward, you know. And where we are telling people that, well, if you want to enforce your data protection right, you have to give up your privacy right. You have to actually, you know, come out to the world and say, yes, you know, I went to an infidelity website, you know, please help me, you know, protect my data. So that's uh, really bad. So we think that... It, in many of those cases, you know, it would be very important for NGOs to be able to take action without the uh, data subject. And then the other point is to protect vulnerable people. I mean, we've seen from the Norwegian Consumer Council, or also in this room, that there are lots of toys, lots of uh, you know, things directed at children that 
breach their privacy, and even if they doesn't breach it directly, you know, there are like something like 67 percent of children apps and services in a survey were found to be collecting personal information. Now, children really will struggle, but not only children. I mean, their parents, you know, who will struggle to supervise their children, will also struggle to understand what's happening there. An NGO can cut through all that. You know, they can do an analysis, see what's happening with an app. You know, forget about trying to find the children. You go and put a complaint or even take them to court. So that would be really, really important. The other thing that's also in group privacy, which is a new concept that many of you have heard, you know, in some cases it's actually quite hard to put the finger on who is the subject, what is the damage, but you know that as a group or as a class, you are being affected by some process, whether it's like some crime mapping initiative, or whether it's, for, for example, data breaches where the value of the data or the impact is very, very slow, small for an individual to actually be bothered to take action, but the cumulative effect of the whole breach is serious enough to potentially have systemic effects and in those cases you know it's just you're not gonna get anyone to complain they're gonna say well can't be bothered but an NGO could take action and force a company to change tack. And finally, you know we think that it's important to bring this power because we think that data privacy and the I mean in theory at least that's been the should be linked to other consumer rights, you know, and not seen purely in isolation. And there is a wealth of experience from consumer groups, you know, in Europe to force companies to change action. In the UK, we have a very good example around like some of financial insurance payments, you know, where NGOs you know, using similar powers to the ones that we're asking have forced pretty much the whole financial sector, you know, to contact people and offer them like economic compensation. So yeah, so it's not too late. I mean, we are in the UK. I mean, we've been campaigning about to try to get this in. We didn't get it, but we got uh, the government to promise a statutory review of the minimal powers and in a couple of years, you know, in theory, they don't work as we know. They want, they should be introducing the, um, the optional powers, but you know, but I mean, we think that this is something that should be debated at least in every other country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. For setting out, okay. <laughs> We're setting out these, uh, the, the priorities and the, the importance. Now perhaps we can go to Katarzyna for a Polish, uh, a Polish perspective. Uh, yes, thank you. I will try to sit down uh, because I have things to, 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 to read or, or check while I speak. And uh, I'm going to keep it short because uh, I see a lot of value in, in, in discussing this with you guys rather with, mm -hmm. than with me giving updates on, on Polish complicated situation. But cutting long story short, we are still in the process of implementing GDPR. So we have seen uh, the first draft of the law in uh, September. Uh, then we had the process of public consultation that has been finalized last week. And right now we are waiting for the second draft of the law after public consultation. So there are still, th th those fights that I'm going to mention are still going on. Uh, nevertheless, I think we, we, we already uh, we can already predict what will happen in terms of article implementing Article uh, 80 of, of GDPR. Uh, the discussion in Poland is dominated with the, the fear or, or, or concerns about possible abuses of this procedure. So whenever we bring this to the public, we hear immediately from, uh, from uh, solicitors, from various industry bodies, concerns that there will be uh, non-ethical, non-governmental organizations that come to blackmail uh, honest entrepreneurs with um, claims in front of DPAs or in front of courts and therefore we need to have that procedure very limited. Uh, you might guess that our answer is uh, full of anger and uh, <laughs> uh, quite bitter. Uh, I do believe that you should not limit any individual or collective redress right uh, claiming that it will be abused. It, it's, it's just absurd. But of course, the, the lobby on the other side is quite effective, quite strong. This is probably why uh, Polish government right now is not even considering creating a, a specialized collective redress procedure in the courts. So regarding civil procedure, uh, the, the right to remedy uh, under Article 17.9 of GDPR or uh, the remedy against supervisory bodies, so Article 78 of GDPR. Here we will not have in Poland any special procedure for NGOs, uh, which means practically that we will not be able to bring as NGOs any cases to civil or, or administrative courts, but will only be able to join the proceedings as uh, amicus of the, of the court uh, or, 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 or as third party intervening standard uh, standard thing that has always been possible, but we will not be able to bring our own cases. 
a, a different scenario uh, is considered for the DPA itself. Uh, so here we, we, we will have um, procedure for four NGOs. Uh, so, so talking about the, the procedure in front of the DPAs, uh, there will be two possibilities. Uh, one uh, is implementation of Article 80.1 uh, GDPR, uh, so uh, more or less standard right to represent individual. Uh, today in Poland there is controversy whether NGO can act as a representative in the court or whether you need a solicitor. Because of that controversy, the government is proposing to clarify that and make sure that, yes, NGOs will be able to go to courts as representatives of individuals. Yes, So the Article 80.1 uh, GDPR will be implemented or will be clarified uh, on the grounds of Polish procedure, giving us the right to do that, uh, even without formal um, paper that we represent individuals. So they, they propose slightly more relaxed procedure, saying that what, uh, if, if there are two conditions fulfilled, whether this is justified by our statute, our, our mission, in case of Panopticon, it's clear that our mission is to defend uh, data protection uh, rights, and whether it is justified by the individual interest, and <coughs> there is individual that we can name, but not necessarily we have a legal, uh, how you call it, a power of attorney. We, we don't need this legal document in hand to do that, but we need individual that we can identify, uh, her or his interest, we have to prove uh, and our, our uh, statutory goals, if all those conditions are fulfilled, we can uh, go directly to, to DPA and even start the case on behalf of this individual or join the case uh, as, as third party to support individuals. So that, that will be uh, clearly stated in the law. Uh, but that's nothing revolutionary and I, I would be extremely surprised if we didn't even have that right. Uh, it's more complicated regarding Article uh, 80.2, so what you call collective redress, or in Poland we rather refer to social interest, so an NGO being able to represent social interest rather than represent a uh, certain individual. Uh, here, uh, the new Polish law implementing GDPR says nothing about that possibility, but we have um, existing administrative um, procedure <coughs> Uh, the Code of Administrative Procedure, which in Article 31 uh, says that there is such a possibility and uh, government confirmed that this is also their intention to, to actually use the existing procedure uh, for, 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 for that. Um, let me double check what exactly that code uh, says. It says that uh, an NGO can, uh, can, can start the case uh, uh, not, uh, not, well, in the case of individual, but not on behalf of individual, uh, if this is, again, justified by uh, the organizational statute or mission and what, uh, if there is a social interest in it. Yes? So theoretically, in practice, it's, it's not used very often, but theoretically, we can go even today, even without new law on data protection, we can go to DPA, not to the court, but to the DPA, and either start the case in social interest, uh, or we can even be notified by the DPA that there is a case interesting for us running uh, and, and join that case. Yes? So, so those, uh, not collective redress procedures, but uh, the procedure enabling NGOs to act in social interest in Poland are already in place and the intention of the government is to, to keep basically those old rules and enable us to start cases in front of the, the, the DPA. Uh, so this is more or less the, 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 the Polish landscape uh, here. Uh, my biggest uh, regret or concern is not uh, what will happen in front of the DPA, because here I believe we have uh, uh, a, a clear procedure to, to, to act, but uh, lack, lack of any procedure for us to bring cases to courts. So to those places that will be able to, uh, to give remedies to individuals and who will have much more impact on on, on individual cases, in fact, because uh, that, that's how we understand the value of GDPR, that individuals will be able to get remedies uh, for uh, infringements in, in data protection and not only have satisfaction that somebody has been fined 
but they got nothing out of this, this fund. Uh, so regarding uh, Article 78 and 79, unfortunately, there is no progress in, in, in Poland, and we will only be able to join those cases as amicus of the court or third party, but not be able to start those cases. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So I think we have a nice overview now of the, the, the important issues, the important questions. We have uh, a Polish perspective and some procedural questions, very important uh, for uh, practitioners, of course. Now, let's open the, the, the debate up, uh, up to your experience, perhaps. Um, anyone who wants to raise a question, any particular experiences you want to share? Um, yes, I think it's... Um, Could you please okay, introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm David Skortowak from Bits of Freedom. Um, just want to briefly say something about the situation in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. because I think it's relatively unique in the, the EU. Uh, we have a fairly liberal system in the Netherlands to actually initiate legal proceedings as an NGO or as a foundation. Um, and that is actually not limited to, say, uh, data protection. It's actually with regard to, well, any rights, or at least a lot of uh, different rights. So, um, and that's already for several years. So in the Netherlands, uh, as a uh, foundation or NGO, you can uh, say initiate uh, a civil, you can go to the civil court mm -hmm. uh, without actually having the requirement to represent actual individuals. Uh, as long as you like, as long as the statutory purpose of your foundation basically is, for, for example, uh, protecting privacy rights. I mean, it has to be a bit specific. There are some, there's some like threshold, but the th threshold I think is relatively low. Have you done so already? Um, not with regard to the data protection, but for example, uh, we can also go to the, uh, say, to an, uh, the DPA or another mm -hmm. supervisory authority. And for example, we've done that recently uh, to enforce the net neutrality uh, mm -hmm. regulations in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. So we can go to a regulatory authority and request them to basically enforce the law. Uh, so that is one way you can do it. Um, and what uh, Kasia was saying about uh, the fear of or the opposition that she's encountering in Poland about like, oh, this will be abused. I think the Netherlands is a good example of a country that has a very liberal system already for several years. And I, in my honest opinion, it hasn't been like abused in massive ways or not abused at all, I think. Uh, so I think that could be a good example for people that encounter a lot of opposition in other member states too. Is it possible for you to, to ask uh, for damages on behalf of individuals? Yeah, no, there's a limitation on that. So you can ask, um, so if you go to a civil court, you cannot ask, uh, well, you could ask damages if you would, well, no, 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 you cannot ask damages if you, uh, say, just represent a public interest. Mm -hmm. There is a proposal in the, uh, it's still waiting in, this, in the parliament to introduce, um, say, collective redress with regard to damages. But you can ask for an, in, uh, in, like an injunction or uh, a declaratory judgment, which I think, especially in the privacy, especially for enforcing privacy rights, I think that is already a very powerful tool, yeah. because you can basically block certain practices or get a declaratory judgment that a certain that the law should be sure. interpreted in a certain way. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. I just want to follow up on what you were saying because it's you, really you important. Can you introduce yourself? So Sorry, it's know? Anna Anna Fielder. Um, just to follow up on what da David was saying, because it's really important, um, and, and also Javier mentioned it, that around Europe there's been a lot of consumer groups taking cases to court on the basis of consumer protection law, also in cases related to digital businesses. Um, there are several countries like Netherlands that have comprehensive collective redress, not just for data protection, but for everything. Uh, for example, Portugal has a very good collective redress system, Belgium, uh, Italy, I believe. Um, so I think it's a very important discussion to be had whether we continue to fight for this Article 82, which very almost no country has uh, implemented, mm -hmm. or whether it is you know, at a European level, more important to fight for a collective redress mm -hmm. European. There's an EU recommendation on collective redress. Mm -hmm. Maybe what we should do is 
fight to introduce the, the collective redress as a directive or regulation in the EU, and that will solve everything. For all consumer cases, not only data protection. Yeah, it will solve um, you know, net neutrality and data protection, along with all the other cases. So that's just a thought. Hi, Fanny from Access Now. Um, and I think there's another element which we really need to push back on, and that's the abusing of a mechanism to enforce your fundamental right, which was a, a typical narrative in Hungary about freedom of information, actually, when they introduced, it's a form of refusal, it's a ground to refuse a Freedom of Information Act request, when the authority can claim that it's abusing the right to, uh, to freedom of information. You mean acting against the government because they will not provide this yes. possibility in procedural law? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you explain this a bit further, like the, the reasoning? Well, there's not much legitimate uh, reasoning behind it. It was just a political act to suppress um, this right. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I'm, I'm Eva Shimon from Liberties, uh, Berlin-based uh, NGO. Uh, so what we can see now, and I think that's uh, that's what's interesting from the Polish perspective, and that's what Fanny was referring to, is that the shrinking space for NGOs, what we call, so in some of the EU member states, what governments do is that they try to limit and push back NGOs' attempt to enforce free, um, any kind of fundamental rights, among others, Hungary, Poland, but we can also mention Ireland and also at, at some points Italy as well from the migration perspective. And if the governments try to push back and limit the NGOs' possibility to enforce specific fundamental rights, we can end up with this argument, and that's what was Fanny maybe referring to. So it's not only a Polish situation, but we can see it's, it's starting broadening all over Europe, or at least some parts of Europe, to uh, to to blame NGOs for certain political issues. I, I will only let me, let me clarify uh, the fear of, of abuse in, in Poland at least. It's not so much related to the actual uh, cases because uh, whether the actual case brought by NGO will be allowed, it is a decision ultimately of the DPA in our case because we are not discussing, of course we're discussing DPA procedure. The DPA will be the body saying, checking whether there is a social interest behind it, whether it's not abusing the law. So this is our argument against the government's argument. That why, why do you fear? Since there's always a public body between us and, 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 and the procedure saying whether we are trying to abuse it or not, right? It's not automatic. We cannot automatically trigger Article 80.1 of GDPR and simply bring the case. We need somebody to acknowledge, yes, you have the right to do this because it is in line with social interest. So, 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 so uh, sorry, Article um, 80.2. Uh, but then they come with another argument saying, no, we are not actually afraid of cases brought by you. We are actually afraid of you going to business, talking directly to companies and threatening them, them directly without going to court or the DPA, uh, that you will do that. And we have experience of that in consumer law, actually. There, there were many events like this in the past on the grounds of consumer law. Uh, or, or um, apparently there were cases of ecological uh, organizations doing something like that. So addressing companies directly and saying you have to, I don't know, uh, pay me money or, or order a service from my NGO. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you do that, I will bring that to court, I will bring that to the administrative body. Uh, so the blackmail that they bring against us as counter argument is not actually uh, about bringing the cases, but about going to companies and blackmailing them that we will do that. Uh, in my opinion, this is complete absurd because it, it, it is we, that can be addressed by simply informing the companies that if they act legally, they have nothing to fear, right? If the company is not acting against the law, why should they be afraid of any organization starting any case on behalf of any individual? So my argument here usually is that if we have so many companies in Poland who are so afraid that they are actually in breach of the law, that they will pay money to anybody on the grounds of such such conversation, 
it, it's clearly the problem with companies, not or those organizations. But the argument doesn't really concern the cases brought by, by us, but the conversations between <laughs> companies and, and, and NGOs. May I add something on the um, collective? Why um, Anna's proposal, I think, is important. Something that um, is the difference between the opt-in or opt-out class actions. I mean, the things that, even with the most optimistic in the implementation of GDPR, for econo to get economic damage, you still would need to be instructed, so you wouldn't be able to implement a proper opt-out mechanism where an NGO can claim uh, economic damages on behalf of a class you know, and then get. So I think that it would be quite important to really have a full collective redress, and I think that's true. I mean, GDPR in itself does not provide, you know, even in the, you know, even in its widest uh, provision, does not provide the full collective redress that would need to be created. You know. okay. Does anybody have a uh, perspective to add? Any thoughts on evaluation of damages, perhaps, or representation of? Um, yeah, um, my name is uh, Jesper Lund uh, from uh, IT Pool Denmark. Um, so I have a general concern that uh, sort of the definition of damages in uh, in some countries, and in particular Denmark, uh, would be so limited that it would be of uh, relatively little value uh, for, say, data protection issues. Uh, um, the Danish government, so specifically the Danish government is, is arguing that even though GDPR says material and non-material damages, so this non-material damages should be interpreted in um, sort of consistency with member states' law, not necessarily uh, European Union law. And Danish courts uh, have generally been very reluctant to award damages unless you can prove a direct financial loss from, from, the, from the action of the, of, the, uh, of the other party. And th this may be difficult in, say, a data breach case. Uh, you are one of 100,000 persons whose information has been, been leaked by uh, a data broker. Uh, but your, your personal data hasn't been abused for, for fraud yet. Uh, but you, so how can you prove uh, a, a direct uh, financial loss in, in cases like that? Um, Have you come up with some kind of construction to um, No, not, not, not really. And it's, it's not really been a, a big discussion issue in Denmark. It's just uh, sort of Danish government has, is generally trying to sort of, uh, sort of say that the GDPR uh, means uh, as little change as possible compared mm -hmm. to the current regime, in, including for, for, for damages. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so if, if that situation is, is similar in, in, in other member states, uh, that, that could yeah. be uh, hurdles to, uh, to, to using damages. And, and it would be useful if, if uh, sort of damages, especially uh, uh, non-material damages, um, was to be interpreted in a, sort of in, in a European, mm -hmm. in a harmonized European way. Mm -hmm. It also makes sense. But I think this, this is an, yeah, an issue of the many European countries struggle with that there is no type of punitive damages mm -hmm. in, in the continental system or in the European system. Uh, does, has anyone uh, any experience with alternative systems for this type of punitive damages or making it worth a while? Not in the UK. No, not in, in the UK? UK it has no. To be related to a you have to prove yeah. your actual damage as an individual. Yeah. Well, yeah. in any dispute, the damage, the compensation has mm -hmm. to be proportional to the actual harm to yeah. go over. Yeah. So you end up uh, having to prove individual harm anyway, even yeah. if you represent yeah. social interest. Yeah. Either you show harm to individuals yeah. or you have no way of, of getting any redress. Yeah. But perhaps there is an, an interesting experience from uh, copyrights, well, in, in the copyright uh, sphere. Because in copyright, of course, there is a lot of experience with collective management organizations, well, collective uh, organizations that represent individual authors that have come up with this type of standardized rates, well, legitimate or not so legitimate. There's always a, a big debate about, about these, uh, these, these evaluations, but perhaps there could be uh, an effort to come to this type of tariffs, maybe? Well, the Any thoughts? Uh, the problem there is that the uh, if, if you were to use the analog of what's mm -hmm. done in, in the copyright infringement sphere, is you would end up with the resale value of of the data that have been, well, let's say, uh, wrongfully processed. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the typical value of, let's say, uh, a medical dossier uh, among data brokers, mm -hmm. then you'll end up with pretty small amounts, actually. Mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the data is typically exchanged again mm -hmm. against monetary compensations among data brokers for, for remarkably low prices. Mm -hmm. 
But that's the thing, like in copyright, the reason often will be, okay, this will be the basic amount, and then you can start counting the infringements, okay, infringement of this yeah. right, infringement of that right, and you can get this effect of doubling, just describing and not as, as defending As someone from an NGO that actually is very much opposed to that way of mm -hmm. uh, calculating damages, I would never advocate that for mm -hmm. data protection uh, issues. Mm -hmm. Then it would not it would be very hard for a lot of people in the OCA to press for that argument Got just for, from yeah. a technical perspective. For? From a from technical perspective, because it tip we typically argue against that kind of reasoning mm -hmm. when it comes to copyright infringement, and then we would use the same argument in, in favor yeah, of data yeah. protection. Right? But the difficulty, of course, that yeah. copyright clearly has this economic component yeah. of yeah. tradability of rights, yeah. which is not is lacking yeah. from. Yes. Sorry, I'm Ailey from Privacy International. I just wanted to add to Javier's comment about what the situation is in the UK. Um, under the current DPA, it said that it was interpreted that it would only be pecuniary damages, mm -hmm. so not for distress. And, and a couple of years ago, the Court of Appeal declared that that was not the case, that it was for distress as well. So the recently, um, in the UK, there's been uh, one of the first class actions in terms of kind of data protection and that was a supermarket that had a big breach. Can you speak up a bit? Oh sorry, there was a supermarket called Morrison's a supermarket. who had a massive um, data breach um, and it, a case was brought on behalf of about five, uh, I think 5,000 employees mm -hmm. and um, that it's going to be appealed so they have um, delayed the quantification of damages but I think that's going to be an interesting case yes. at least in the UK to see how that is addressed because um, the amounts actually given in the few data protection cases that there have been have been relatively high for distress mm -hmm. and because there's not um, enough litigation on it so far, a lot of things are settled out of court. Yeah. So I think that um, there's still not enough clarity, but I think that's going to be an interesting case to watch because it's very clear now in the UK and there's no discussion in terms of um, implementation of GDPR that there will never be damages for distress. There's clearly going to be damages yeah. for distress and that, that's no longer a question in the UK. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for this uh, for this perspective. Now I think it would be good for us to move on to the second uh, session unless there is someone who really needs to get something off their chest. No? Okay. Uh, then let's, uh, let's, let's discuss our uh, second subject which um, is about the, the notice and take down the actions, well, the fight against illegal content on, on platforms. Now, um, the Commission has taken a number of initiatives to tackle the presence of uh, illegal content uh, online. And so far, our legal framework consists mainly of the e-commerce directive. We have a very clear principle, an intermediary, an ISP, um, can escape liability for the presence of illegal or harmful content on uh, their platforms, uh, provided that it has no knowledge, and if there is knowledge, it takes down these um, these procedures, uh, these uh, this illegal content quite quickly. Now, there's no general obligation of monitoring on the intermediaries, and that's quite an important uh, principle. But of course, we're confronted with a whole bunch of well content, a lot of uh, expressions, information that is not necessarily desirable on, uh, on, these, um, on these platforms. Mm -hmm. And we can think of a whole variety of, of, of uh, harmful content in this sense, the harmful content that is not strictly illegal on the one side, and then illegal content we can think of, well, copyright infringement, counterfeit uh, medicine, consumer goods, uh, we can think of um, defamation, uh, libel, uh, slander, racist speech, um, hate, uh, incitement to, to, uh, to, to hatred. And we think of, well, third category maybe, terrorism uh, and child pornography, where mostly I think people can agree it's, it's not so difficult to identify whether or not we, uh, there's, there's illegal, um, illegal content. Now, this is a concern for the Commission. And they have come up with this uh, 2017 uh, communication proposing a, a number of measures to be taken by the platforms themselves in order to make these networks a safer space in their, in, uh, in their opinion. Now there's a whole bunch of um, uh, questions to be raised and a, a number of concerns uh, to be raised, which will be discussed by Marianne and uh, Fanny. Who wants to? 
start. Marianne is going to start. You're going to address uh, address the measures proposed by the commission. Yeah, the basically the, the big picture. Uh, so thanks so much. I'm Marianne. I work for European Data Rights Entry as a senior policy advisor. It's a pleasure to be here with you and um, you know following the previous format, the ideas to discuss because most of you are already aware of this and those who don't. I hope that uh, what Fanny and I will present will clear in uh, your minds. So on the one hand, we have a trend towards um, uh, pub uh, pushing companies to do more on several public policy objectives, as it was mentioned before. And then so we're asking, and not all companies, but only the big platforms to become the legislator, the executive, and the judicial power of the internet. And that's what we call uh, in every privatized law enforcement. Uh, and to be clear, what they're being pushed for to do is not to implement the law. What they are pushed for to do is uh, to implement their terms of service that were drafted by them. They're not, as you know, democratically elected bodies. And contrary to legislation, whether we like it or not, uh, is drafted by them to basically avoid any type of liability. So in, in the current picture, uh, we not only have like the basic e-commerce directive, we have many um, legislative and non-legislative initiatives. Um, y y we can name a few, like the uh, terrorism directive, the Europol regulation, uh, the ongoing discussions on the audiovisual media services directive. We also have the copyright reform uh, that is uh, also ongoing. Uh, we also have the uh, hate speech code of conduct. Uh, in relation to the framework decision on racism and xenophobia. We also have different member states' laws, as the most famous one currently is the uh, German SDG, that, as you know, has many problematic issues. And um, you mentioned before the communication of the Commission on tackling illegal content. Mm -hmm. Uh, from our perspective, there are several issues with this communication. The first is that the assumption that we can solve everything uh, by technology. So there's a, a trend towards regulation by algorithm. So uh, if you hear uh, the claims by uh, certain parts of the commission, it's, it's assumed that if we ask the giants uh, to take care of uh, what we do online, uh, developing some tech uh, technical tool, uh, you know, will solve uh, hate speech online, will solve terrorism online, and so on. Uh, then there's no effort at all to know uh, and to assess really um, what what type of content is being removed. Um, there's obviously if you're a big company and then it, you're being threatened with uh, public relation problems, reputation problems, and also uh, faced in cases, for example, like Germany, of um, sanctions, you may want to delete. Um, uh, all the, the referrals that you're being um, 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 yeah that you're being uh, referred to right uh, and then so um, there's if you're especially a smaller company you would not even have the resources to make legal assessments about whether the content in question is actually legal or not so is there are some questions that uh, could be asked one is is the removal of a tweet the solution for terrorism online when the removal is subject to the voluntary consideration of big platforms on the basis of the terms of service and not the law. This is Article 4.1M of the Europol regulation. Is framing six tweets as glorification of terrorism when actually making politically sensitive statements um, uh, a solution to fight against terrorism online? This is the Cesar Strawberry case in Spain, as ruled in the Supreme Court, where a rapper uh, was uh, uh, sentenced to prison because of putting six tweets that, by the way, are now uh, being disclosed uh, in the press. So is the press also glorifying terrorism? Are we really solving terrorism by putting people in prison? Um, third, is the solution to terrorism online uh, to state in the law that if you glorify terrorism on the internet, automatically this means that um, the sanction that you would receive is higher as if you did it offline. Uh, this is actually a provision of the Spanish criminal code. And I put Spanish examples because I'm Spanish. But we could make many other examples uh, from different member states. Uh, the most salient ones uh, are uh, friends uh, in Spain, but many others as well. So the current framework is designed for everybody to be some from responsibility. And so, in my view, it's just a public relations theater to see who, remo who removes more and more quickly. And so if, if we keep regulating the internet just for the big giants to decide what we do or not to do or what is right or wrong, uh, then 
the internet will become just the internet yeah it's because uh, even the commissioner uh, Jurova was asked uh, just yesterday uh, on, in the context of hate speech uh, like so what about smaller companies uh, so uh, are these giants uh, willing to share their magical technological tools and they said yes of course but uh, you know this is not charity uh, and um, because the big ones, and I'm quoting, know that if the small ones will spoil this, the legislation will fall, fall on all of them. So basically, we don't have any interest in the non giants to actually even you know, take action. So the focus is really on PR um, uh, theater, on uh, who removes within 24 hours and who removes most. Um, and not to actually solve the problem. Um, and so that's, these are like the freedom uh, of expression uh, concerns, broadly speaking, but there's also privacy and uh, data protection uh, problems. For example, the ADPS already in 2013, so five years ago, already stated that uh, notice and action procedures may apply the possessing of sensitive data, especially if you're dealing with um, potential criminal offenses. Uh, the ADPS also made some recommendations uh, to take into account privacy and data protection legislation uh, when dealing with uh, illegal content online, for example, the confidentiality of the notice provider and the other persons involved. So we could ask questions such as, is the so-called trusted flaggers and the big companies having an encrypted channel or a secure channel to actually exchange potentially criminal um, uh, proof before a court? Um, the answers we are getting from Edry are is, is no. Uh, and uh, there are many other recommendations that have been made uh, in the past that are not uh, being put, simply put forward because there's not the political will to actually make a change. However, to be a bit optimistic, there's a, on the other hand, there's a very good trend towards making things right. So uh, the Council of Europe has made several recommendations on both privacy and freedom of expression in relation to intermediaries and the obligations of both states and companies. And this is, uh, these are quite good, broadly speaking. You have also the UN Special Rapporteur, David Kay, that is pu put, putting forward several recommendations to go into the right direction. You also have several members of the European Parliament that are also trying to make things right. Uh, but uh, we need to really make sure that we can use this political momentum, let's say, to change it. Uh, if you look at Edward's website, you see that a uh, decade ago we were arguing the same things and we are changing. So uh, I wonder, do we need maybe uh, freedom of expression law as we have privacy laws? Do we need to check um, as other uh, experts are exploring uh, if we perhaps instead of focusing on freedom of expression check um, whether um, there's any other implications for example on freedom of thought um, because it's an absolute right uh, contrary to freedom of expression. Uh, can we, is there a way that we can really move forward and then move from a PR uh, perspective, which would only benefit the, the giants, as uh, Commissioner Jirova likes to frame it, or to find a solution that actually brings change? Uh, obviously, as an individual and as a part of a society, I don't like uh, terrorism. And uh, same in Belgium, uh, you, you see that uh, we are quite, uh, quite affected. But that doesn't mean that anything is the solution. That doesn't mean that just removing the, the content without assessing that this has any counterproductive effects uh, is a solution. That doesn't mean that uh, if Google and Facebook um, and Twitter take uh, the lead, we'll solve the problem. <coughs> so we're just asking for some diligence um, in this sphere. Thank you so much for this. What do you have to add to this? Uh, Warm uh, expose. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Fanny. I work for Access now, and I apologize. I have a sore throat, but I'll try to speak up. Um, so, among the many issues Marianne discussed uh, and told us about the push to do something, I chose one which for me represents one of the biggest uh, bubbles without any specific grounds, and that's the push to do something about fake, fake news. Um, I chose this topic for three reasons related to this session. <coughs> the publication of two very recent studies, uh, two changes announced by Facebook very recently, and the Commission's uh, high-level expert group that's, uh, that just uh, been set up. Um, so I will start with the question of the problem definition and why and how and what are we talking about when, when it's fake news. And obviously, this is nothing new. I love the example of um, 
Article 19 dug up uh, an English King decree from uh, 1647 on fake news. It, it, it looks great, I'll, I'll share after. Uh, but to be honest, why we're talking about this is uh, a political pressure about the US election and to a lesser extent about Brexit. So there is a push to do something, when in fact, when, he have, when we have started reading investigative journalistic reports about the Russian government or oligarchs close to the Russian government directly funding far-right parties in Eastern Europe but elsewhere too, there was push to do nothing. So why, why the difference? Uh, the, two, the two recent studies uh, that were published, one of them is uh, from Stanford, the other, the other one is from Dartmouth uh, College. And the authors, of course, have several caveats about the conclusions they make, and I'll try not to fall into the same trap as some of our colleagues on the business side usually do when they quote these studies. My favorite one was about how e-privacy hinders innovation. There was one caveat uh, that they could not close out any other factors or legislations that led to the same hindering in, in the innovation. But yes. So um, the studies uh, looked at uh, consuming news online. Uh, one of them excluded social media, which is uh, probably a big uh, uh, caveat, of course, the other one did include social media, and they both <coughs> concluded that fake news had probably very, very little to to impact the outcome of the U.S. election, and uh, the main source of political information is still TV ads. They give us a ratio how to compare the uh, exposure to fake news as opposed to a TV ad, which might just be as propagandistic, I would say. They say that um, in order to have any impact on, on the election, uh, a fake news story would have uh, convinced about 0.7% of Clinton voters or non-voters who sought the, to make the shift. Uh, and they make a persuasion rate equivalent to seeing 36 television campaign ads. The huge question is what they use as a benchmark how you believe in any of those and how that persuasion happens. Um, the, based on the surveys, people visited, one, one in every four uh, person uh, uh, visited fake news uh, websites and they uh, defined fake news websites based on only um, sources that came to life in order to spread that type of information. So they exclude Breitbart, for instance. Uh, the funny thing is, though, that literally zero person has checked fact-checking uh, fact sites or counterclaims when they searched or found um, fake news. So it puts into question the uh, upcoming, um, upcoming uh, approach of the commission when they focus a lot on, on fact-checking mm -hmm. in the future. Um, moving on to Facebook's two new changes very quickly. One of them, as you probably have heard, that they will deprioritize news from media and uh, organizations, and they will prioritize friends and that type <coughs> of content. Um, and Mark Zuckerberg said that this would probably lead to people spending less time on Facebook, but that's a sacrifice he's uh, <laughs> willing to make in order for the experience to be more valuable. Well, it's definitely going to be more valuable. The question is, for whom? Uh, because uh, online marketing experts, salespeople started to look into the impact of, of that change in the algorithm, and they can find three ways. Either there's no change, the, the second- In the algorithm? Uh, the no, 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 in the, in the ad revenue, and yeah. how, how price of Facebook ads will be impacted by this change. Uh, the second one, if you spend less time on Facebook and related ads, it means that there would be less total supply. And um, well, that's just a very basic uh, logic that the, co that the price of Facebook ads will increase. And only the players who you also mentioned, who the big players, not necessarily the same ones, will have money to afford those type of uh, uh, ads. 
And the third assumption, the third approach, is that um, there will be a collective loss in organic reach, which uh, entities will have to uh, combat. And that will mean a larger total demand for Facebook ads, leading to the exact same conclusion, Facebook ad prices will go up. Is it established that there will be uh, less this, these are assumptions based on uh, people who are doing social media marketing and try to ad try to sell you packages of how you advertise on Facebook. Um, but I think uh, obviously these are very preliminary assumptions, but both lead to Facebook benefiting from those changes. So finally, to finish up, uh, there's a new fake news expert group being set up by the European Commission. Uh, congratulations to Baruch who made it uh, to the to the expert group. We are not so lucky, many of us in this uh, in this room, um, and including David K. For instance, many many uh, freedom of expression groups have been rejected, and there's a gen general lack of transparency. And there's one interesting part of the timeline of the fake news expert group because there's a parallel public consultation, but the timeline of the push to do something won't allow the public consultation to be taken into account in the outcome of what the commission is proposing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Very enthusiastic, Je yes. Jeff Chester, our digital democracy Fanny is right. The reaction from US uh, ad tech experts is this is a move by Facebook so it will force the global big advertisers to buy more advertising because they no longer will have that so-called organic reach. So it's about boosting Facebook revenues and boosting face Facebook's expansion of video advertising, video marketing. Thank you so much. Yeah. It was a, it's a very rich, uh, very rich uh, subject. Um, I see, well, issues of fundamental rights, uh, balancing between fundamental rights, I see issues related to uh, the, the role of courts and private uh, well, private actors or even law enforcement. <laughs> um, there's economic uh, issues as well. Who wants, who wants to add anything? Yes. Um, so as a general plea for um, accountable democratic law-based approaches, if the commission does something by law, it has to respect the charter. It has to be able to show that it's predictable, that it's necessary, that it's proportionate, that it genuinely achieves objectives of general interest. Ad hoc, arbitrary, please do something, guys. It would be nice. We can put out a press release. Is, uh, has no review mechanism, has no impact assessment, has no assessment of durability, has no assessment of counterproductive effects, has no um, uh, assessment of anti-competitive effects has no impact on the, the privacy effects. And the, what you just said, sorry, is, is really uh, interesting on the, the, the balancing, because it's a network. So a simple balance is rarely there. So in the, in the Delphi case in the European Court of Human Rights, um, somebody uploaded um, defamatory comments. The provider, uh, the, the Newspaper removed the content quickly when they became aware of it. And uh, the court said, no, uh, you need to be able to identify the individuals so that they can be blamed for what they do. Well, what are the options for a newspaper to identify their user? Oh, they can use Facebook's free uh, identification uh, tool. So you end up, you start off with freedom to do business and uh, defamation, and then you end up with a third element. If you're going to uh, impose that liability, then you end up with the privacy infringement happening accidentally, and that, that three-sided balance was never assessed. Um, Austria is about to refer a, a case uh, to the European Court of, uh, the Court of Justice of the EU, whether Facebook should be required to uh, prevent, on a global level, uh, the availability of certain uh, defamatory slash hate speech comments. It's, it looks like a balance between uh, Facebook's uh, obligations 
and uh, the rights of the individual who was defamed. But if you ask for prevention, then you're asking for additional data processing by, by Facebook. Um, and then you've got the privacy of everybody who's, who's having their, their data filtered. Um, so it's, it's a privacy issue and a defamation issue and a freedom to do business issue. And also, uh, and this is fundamental in this whole area, you can use the law and you can use public relations to push the companies to do more. There is, they have a legal obligation not to do too little, but they have no legal obligation not to do too much. They have freedom of contract. You can push them and push them and they will delete more and more. It's actually quite easy to press delete. Defending freedom of expression and defending the privacy in that environment is, is tremendously... Uh, well, this is the thing that struck me as one in this communication of the Commission. Well, we have this general principle of, well, no general obligation of, of monitoring, but now all of a sudden there's an obligation to provide a lot of mechanisms. You have to have, to have a mechanism to monitor, the mechanism to, to remove, you have to have a mechanism to profile even the users and have this preemptive uh, approach, which is quite interesting because it means that your general monitoring will not be done by the network but by the users of the network which may come down to the same thing maybe any thoughts mm. how about this um one of the, the the problems that may be there is of course that well the courts have established a number of tests so we have the court of justice for example in uh cases the promusica case for example, balancing between copyright and, uh, and, and data protection, where it states, well, there needs to be a fair balance between these fundamental rights. It's difficult to, to establish a more precise test, of course, but how will this be done by so social networks, by, by these platforms? How could they do this in practice? Any thoughts? I'd say th there's no mechanism to require them to do it. No. Um, there cannot be a mechanism to require them to do it. They can be given liability, mm -hmm. they can be given PR pressure, um, but you can't stop them. Mm -hmm. They have a balance of incentives. Either you create, which is tremendously difficult, a balance of incentives for them to leave content online mm -hmm. or to take content offline that hits the provided for by law um, standard of the charter, uh, or you don't. And if you don't, you are undermining the rule of law mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. democratic freedom of expression rights for European citizens with global effects and uh, the ABMS and the Copyright Directive are going to have global, really detrimental effects for free freedom of expression and democracy around the world. Mm -hmm. And But then the Commission also included in, in, the, in, in the communication, there needs to be mechanisms to put content back on <coughs> so if the, the poster once they exist, like that will be the, the, the counterbalance. That's Where there's no obligation. The Commission would like this. Mm -hmm. so I think it's the refusal of um, governments to take responsibility and bring um, any measures under like strict uh, human rights mm -hmm. framework, and that is uh, one of the fundamental problems. I mean, in the UK, we've been hearing this a general trend. They won't force companies to do something. So, for example, in the um, in copyright, we mentioned the, there is an, agree an agreement between the City of London Police and advertisers, where the City of London Police provides a list of potentially infringing um, websites for copyright, and advertisers take measures. Now, you ask the advertiser to say, "Is the police that gave us the list?" And you ask the police, and they say, "No, we're just giving them the list. You're not telling them what to do with it." And this lead, we have spent now like several years trying to untangle that. And there is just no, no one takes responsibility. Yeah. And I think that that is like the perfect example of what we are, yeah. he, what we are having. So nobody takes a stance, it's just suggestions no. and implicit yeah. messaging. So the, the police will give a list of right. websites and say, you know what to do with this. And the other, the other, so when you ask them, they say, well, we didn't tell them to do anything, you know. And then when you ask the advertisers, they say, look, the police gave us a list. Mm -hmm. You know, and of course, you know, we have to ask you, you to ask the police, you know, if you want to mm -hmm. clarify. But no one, I mean, it is literally impossible, like a complete uh, an accountable system. Mm -hmm. And that's what we are seeing. I mean, that is really the model that we are seeing now. Mm -hmm. Any other experiences? Anyone wants to share? 
I mean, the same model is replicated mm -hmm. at the EU level in the Europol regulation. I mentioned yeah. it briefly. Uh, so, with the creation of the Europol regulation, we have an EU internet referral unit where Europol needs to refer content to the platforms and then is uh, subject to the platform's voluntary consideration to, do, to deal with this content. And so, when you go to expert meetings, for example, I was part of an expert meeting in the Parliament where uh, Europol was presenting and just saying, complaining because they didn't have enforcement power. Uh, over what the companies uh, can do with it, mm -hmm. but obviously there's no assessment of legality um, mm -hmm. in that uh, process. However, their national uh, internal referral units are trying to uh, implement best practices, and Europol apparently is not helping these internal referral units to actually establish them. So this is the case, for example, of the Netherlands, uh, where some step forwards have um, been happening and uh, to assess the content not on the basis of terms of service, but the, the actual law in the Netherlands. Uh, so this is mm -hmm. uh, a good um, mm -hmm. a good practice that is not being practice, put yeah. forward. Yeah. But we can learn from best practices mm -hmm. and maybe try to really um, make sure that everybody takes responsibility, not just like the big pla platforms. Um, and uh, that's it. Mm -hmm. And that's the end of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, has the ETPS commented on this on the privacy implications? Yes, repeatedly. I will always mm -hmm. come back to this part. Yeah. <coughs> on, the, um, on the content note, something that you said at the beginning that there were some, when we look at what kind of things are being blocked, I mean, you said that sometimes very, there are some things that are very easy mm -hmm. to, and some that are harder. Mm -hmm. I mean, we take a little bit of issue with that because the, I mean, what we are seeing, uh, apart from the very worrying trend towards proactive, <coughs> you know, proactive, pervasive monitoring, the other things like the expansion of the um, things that are covered. So in the UK, the UK government has been trying to implement um, restrictions on extremist content for several years, which they see as like the precursor of terrorism. So they say, well, in Muslim teenagers, you know, they start talking about radical Islam, they get radicalized, you know, before they do anything terrorist, they are being extremist. And of course, they cannot make an anti-Muslim law because that would be discriminatory, so they're trying to define extremism in the abstract. And it's just impossible. They just struggle, you know, they've tried years and years, you know, and there is just no way that you can you just cannot define them. They talk about being against British values, mm -hmm. against democracy, you know, against you know but there is it's just really, really hard. But so glorification of terrorism. Well, glorification it's very of, yeah, it's so that is notion. yeah. Mm -hmm. So for example in Facebook anything to do with the PKK colors, like mm -hmm. will get your website taken down because the PKK is a proscribed organization. Ireland is a signatory to lots of UN treaties, you know, and because Ireland is <coughs> in Ireland, mm -hmm. you know, there is anything the PKK can be taken down with the colors of the PKK. Notification of terrorism. Do you know why they do this? Is there some kind of contact between a, a government and some? Yeah, Facebook someone. Or? Yeah, when someone from the Turkish government contacts Facebook oh. in Ireland, yeah. you know, for the EMEA thing, they take down the content automatically. Mm -hmm. But the, and then on terrorism, I mean, you say sometimes it's easy, but actually a lot of the content that we see, uh, if you look at some of the speeches of Anwar al lucky the cleric that was vaporized by the U.S. in Yemen a few years ago, and he's 16-year-old son as well. I mean, a lot of the stuff he was saying is quite outrageous. A lot of the stuff he's saying is just like radical Islamic politics, you know, with no call for terrorism or anything. I mean, it's just like a very, very thin line. There is stuff that is simply Islamic songs and things that are cultural, are part of the culture of ISIS. You know, it's like not calling for anything, but it's just like the uh, like same way that hip hop and gangsters, you know, in the U.S. go together. In some cases, you know, and that is and that stuff that is being banned as terrorist material right now. You know, so it's I mean, I think that it's actually really, really tricky to draw a line. You know, and same even with child abuse. I mean, you know, Wikipedia got shut down because they had the front cover of a record that had a 12-year-old naked girl in the front page, and the whole of Wikipedia got shut down for child porn. So, I mean, it is really, really tricky. And did you get to a court? And there is a clear ruling, you know, that you are in a gray area, for yeah. anything. Yeah, it takes a very long time. Yeah, and, um, yeah, I totally agree with that, that it's very difficult. And if we leave it into the hand of these big giants, decide over our fundamental rights, that would pose a big, big problem. And it's not only related to, to free speech and privacy issues, but all the others as well. So when, uh, so what, what, what we find very problematic from the from the fundamental rights perspective is that is that we are and and what what the EU is doing is just pushing liability towards these big platforms and asking them to introduce mechanism and non-transparent mechanisms. So I mean we don't, we know nothing about 
what they re remove, when they remove, and even that those very controversial issues like the Delphi case which was mentioned, and later on the European Court of Human Rights in a Hungarian case decided a bit differently, uh, that shows that at different level, different courts don't even agree where to draw the line between free speech and defamatory or other, or even hate speech issues. And when we ask these platforms to decide, they would say, no, we are censoring, we are deleting, and we are removing, and no individual has the strength to go for and push for the after taking down certain content to upload online again. That is, that is, I mean, there is no Burden balance between, to, yeah, between, the, between the, the players. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone else, uh, perhaps a last comment, questions? No, I, I'm just wondering where should we draw the line as, as network of, of uh, advocates here uh, and maybe proposition would be that, okay, notice and takedown is a good mechanism as long as there are individual rights involved or what, as long as there is specific harm you can prove, mm -hmm. even the bloody copyright, okay, we don't love it, but we understand it can be uh, established that there is somebody's harm. Of course, privacy is uh, something that I would be always in favor of using the takedowns for for privacy inf infringements, but usually you have individual, even hate speech, you can establish, if not individual, then collective harm of certain group. But all other types of content, uh, like nudity or, or um, fake news or whatever will come next, should not be at all considered for this procedure. Maybe, maybe if we if we try to establish as a network some kind of red line and try to advocate for it, we might be more effective in stopping this madness that will be you know, dragging more and more types of content uh, 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 under the procedure that I think we endorsed some time ago as good tool to, for example, protect privacy, but it's it's not effective tool to protect other societal interests. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we need a cr 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 yeah. criterion that we can express. Um, for us, the, one of the lines that we found important is the mechanisms for social media to have mechanisms to deal with abuse. I mean, in the UK, <coughs> you know, in other countries, but the UK, in particular, the women on Twitter, they get systematically harassed, you know, and there's and there seems to be like on the one hand like this obsession with dealing with terrorist material, and then you see women, you know, getting like rape threats constantly, you know, and then nothing happens. You know. So I think that that imbalance of starting that would be a good starting point. I think then from there you can maybe build an accountable system with due process and start taking that. Okay, thank you so much. If nobody has any pressing <coughs> comments anymore, then perhaps we can move. To uh, Giovanni for the closing uh, closing remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sari. Thank you, uh, Xavier, Jacques-Jean, uh, Kaja, Fanny, uh, Marianne, and, and all others contributing to this, let's say, annual tradition. Um, the last one was uh, actually in uh, May 2016, but it was, uh, let's say, a more restricted audience. We uh, now see a bigger one. Uh, good friends from uh, outside the EU, so I think we, uh, we should continue looking uh, forward to, uh, let's say, reinforce uh, this, uh, this tradition uh, to go beyond the two excellent uh, hours. We, we dedicated to a couple of uh, very important items and perhaps uh, provide for, uh, apart from regularity, an opportunity to let's say, uh, identify conversion lines of, uh, of action with full respect of what we do as, uh, let's say, independent supervisory authorities <coughs> and, uh, let's say, uh, civil society. So, uh, once again, thank you for your active dedication, passion, and, and, and engagement. The issues you selected, as I said, are of the utmost importance of the uh, EPS. Um, of course, I will start by referring to um, the issue of col uh, collective uh, redress uh, mechanism and damages, needless to say, that all victims of data protection and privacy violation uh, will suffer a lot of uh, damages, uh, not only financial or reputational, but also in a few cases emotional, psychological, should, uh, let's say, um, be able to have an effective uh, reports for an effective uh, remedy. This is not only an obligation because of Article 47 of the Charter, but it's, it's because, um, let, let's say, of de facto, because of the essence of uh, the, the new uh, legal uh, framework on, on data protection. 
The emphasis is now around Article 80 of the uh, GDPR. GDPR as a whole is not the, the ideal uh, piece of legislation we may envisage, but it's the best we can achieve uh, today, even if we start once again after four years of, of negotiations. Um, the right to mandate, yes, uh, it's an important uh, paragraph one in Article uh, 80. You know that we have been pushing for uh, something something more. Uh, paragraph 2 of Article 80 represents a compromise uh, solution, so the idea that you may lodge uh, a complaint as uh, initially proposed by the, um, the Commission. Um, it is not exactly what we had in, uh, in mind, but it's a, a, st a good starting uh, point, and, and perhaps uh, the, the trilogue around the uh, privacy regulation may offer uh, a real uh, collective redress uh, mechanism in uh, such a specific area, who knows. Um, I think it's time we, uh, we cooperate more in uh, following the legislative developments at member states level, including the implementation of Article uh, 80. Signals coming from uh, Germany, UK and Italy are not encouraging in, uh, in that sense, meaning nothing new in addition to the right to, to mandate and the right to lodge a complaint, although the right to lodge a complaint means uh, the right to be heard, uh, the right to be informed in a reasonable period about the, uh, the outcome. It's time uh, for all of us, including the DPS, to send signals to, uh, to data controllers in terms of uh, accountability. I would really love you to start being, uh, let's say, uh, more engaged in the digital clearing house uh, exercise. I have been following your comments about the specificity of privacy and data protection as compared to other consumer protection uh, rules. And uh, I think the exercise we started uh, on the competition um, not only relates to antitrust but also to the idea that uh, consumer laws should not uh, work anymore uh, in silos as well as, as, as data production and, and privacy. So that's an exercise, that's a forum where we may really have, um, in addition to this uh, uh, practice of the, the summit, to share ideas and identify a solution for possible let's say, incentives to the legislation. The signals I, I, um, I envisage should be, in my view, more coordinated, more strategic. This is not a criticism, but this is time uh, for uh, the civil society uh, approaching the full implementation of the GDPR to, um, to be more visible, uh, to be more selective, to be more strategic, and, and to coordinate actions at least in, uh, uh, in Europe. Um, the 20 hour working party has adopted um, a huge number of uh, guidelines um, due to the need to, let's say, assist data controllers in terms of uh, accountability. But the new uh, procedure uh, within the GDPR uh, about future guidance by EDPP will be very different, at least in terms of public consultation. This is a big opportunity for uh, you to interact more with uh, this network of independent DBAs. But independent DBAs do not absorb the implementation of the GDPR. And, and so there is an issue of visibility um, before uh, national uh, courts, where, um, I mean, uh, I see um, a growing number of uh, uh, leading cases, not only related to data protection, but also to privacy in the traditional, uh, in the traditional sense. So it would be a good idea to also um, establish, uh, let's say, a simple database to, to monitor how uh, the, uh, the GDPR and the related uh, national um, laws uh, adopted after the, the GDPR would, uh, would work. Um, essential is also to have a reflection about the uh, reuse of money you may get uh, as a result of uh, a collective redress uh, mechanism. Uh, regrettably, at least in my country, we had in the past very negative um, um, experiences of um, money uh, improperly reused uh, as a result of uh, 
a non-transparent agreement with certain uh, operators, particularly in the telecom uh, in the telecom area. Um, so there is a lot of work, and uh, I think uh, it's time we um, synchronize more our action. Uh, please consider uh, the EDPS as, a, a, let's say, a good partner. Um, about fake news, um, we have no time to enter into details. We uh, interacted many times, at least twice, in 2012 and, and 2015. Um, in, in 2015 as a result of a public uh, consultation and I think we share many of the uh, comments I found in the recent uh, uh, position by, uh, by every, uh, for instance, uh, the lack of a definition of a legal content, the uncertainty about the borderline between what is simply helpful and what is, uh, what is illegal. Uh, the signals I see uh, around Europe are very scattered and, and fragmented. Germany has interfered with, a, let's say, a, a national approach which is um, considered a little bit uh, problematic outside uh, Germany. Uh, Sweden has established an independent uh, body. Italy has reacted recently with a couple of initiatives very um, criticized. Um, an establishment of a task force uh, by the police and, and therefore many others uh, published articles by centers is not a, a police related uh, issue. Um, another um, piece of legislation now provides a national level in my country of origin for um, a decision uh, taken by the independent uh, uh, authority in the telecom area in my view, in a very questionable uh, way, according to the specific protection for the freedom of uh, and, and security of communication within our constitution, which only provides for an intervention by the judicial uh, authority. Um, so we, we see how different countries are uh, approaching. Therefore, I can only endorse uh, the proposal by EDI and others for a, a European Union uh, approach, um, which uh, I do not expect uh, during this mandate. Uh, I understand that the Commission will not adopt uh, anything uh, special after May, June this year, and, and therefore uh, I think we will have time to, let's say, prepare the, uh, the future. We will keep you informed about any additional position by, by us. Let me uh, briefly um, uh, draw your attention on the incoming um, Olympic Games on privacy data protection. Um, we've been working for years uh, to do it uh, together with uh, one sister uh, authority, the one for Bulgaria. Why? Because they were expected to uh, lead the presidency of the council in the second uh, semester, which is not anymore the case. It would be on the ethical uh, dimension um, of uh, of the data processing on, on digital ethics as a, as a whole. It will not be a blah, blah, blah uh, exercise. We are uh, very uh, ambitious. We know some uh, skepticism by data protection uh, colleagues uh, saying that GDPR is uh, a priority. But I will repeat um, before you my assumption. Uh, data protection is an important piece of legislation, but does not provide all the answers to the challenges of the digital uh, society. Uh, I would like to explore um, in depth um, to which extent uh, we, we may need of uh, additional, um, let's say, actions in terms of sustainability of certain data processing uh, operations to analyze what is not only technically feasible but also morally more tenable and therefore we have to better analyze what is ethics in addition to data protection, not to replace uh, the data protection, not to weaken data protection principle, to extend ethics that is already embedded within existing data protection rules. Who is entitled to speak about ethics? Which ethics? Uh, a global ethics, a sectoral one. Um, we, we, we discuss around the world about the uh, interoperability of different uh, standards on, on, on data protection. It's more than 20 years. Why we should agree on, on ethical principles, but that's the, that's the challenge we would like to analyze together with uh, data controllers. 
we will analyze um, the, di uh, the digital edits of the Iraqi law enforcement, and we would like to better understand to which extent data controllers, government, legislators, um, civil society, and uh, data controllers are, let's say, um, engaged and entitled to make this um, principle, additional principle on ethics effective in, in practice. Be on board. Um, we, we sent you uh, a letter on 19th of uh, December. It uh, was addressed to the Global uh, Civil Society Coalition as a whole. We invited you uh, in an uh, answer to your, uh, your letter. We invited you to take um, an active role uh, by, for instance, uh, nominating uh, a representative, a couple of persons for to the advisory committee to share your ideas about the, the open session. Uh, it will not be based on panels, but on a lot of debates. It will be in the uh, hemicycle of the European Parliament with a lot of microphones available to, to the public. We are discussing about reduced fees for the civil society as compared to previous uh, editions. We are discussing about the idea to finance a, a few uh, speakers from uh, the civil uh, society and, and to be of an help as EPS with regard to your uh, side events and, and <coughs> logistical uh, arrangements. Um, we need of an answer soon because time, time is running um, and, and therefore you see uh, that a um, few people from uh, from my staff is, uh, is around. Bernani um, Chirasau is uh, the, the contact point for the, the letter. Um, uh, don't, don't be shy and, and, be, uh, and be on board uh, as soon as, as possible. What else? Uh, thank you for your initiative. We have an EDTS family photo to be published on the hour uh, annual uh, report at 12.30 sharp uh, in the European Parliament, so we need to go together with Wojciech. Uh, Unless there is any burning question, uh, once again, thank you for uh, being around and hope to see you soon.